Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming. A show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. So, this episode I thought I would just give you a little update about what I've been up to uh, as of late. Uh, as I mentioned previously, I was going to begin working on uh, designing my own carrier game. Um, so I have started doing that. So that's what you see before here, here right now. So I kind of just share a little bit of, um, you know, what I'm doing here, what I'm thinking about, um, that kind of thing. You know, just got, I guess, maybe a little bit like a design diary entry here in the BBW uh, series. So my intention on this was basically try to make a carrier game that falls in complexity somewhere between the carrier flat top level and the fires of Midway. Something that gives the feel, the essence of what carrier warfare was like from a command perspective. Uh, you know, in charge of the task force. You're the admiral in charge of the task force kind of thing. So that is my goal here. And in making this design, I have drawn upon the ideas uh, of both John Southard, who created Carrier, and also of the late uh, S. Craig Taylor, who designed Flattop, and also the two Smithsonian games, Midway and uh, Guadalcanal, uh, published by Avalon Hill Games back in the early 90s, I believe both of those came out. So I tip my hat to both of them, because a lot of what they did um, is really inspired me, and I've kind of tinkered with some things, and I've simplified some things and actually reached out to Mr. Southern uh, and told him what I was doing and, you know, explained to him I was inspired by it. I hope he didn't mind if I borrowed some things and stuff. And he basically responded very graciously with, you know, the comment about, you know, getting as far as you do because you stand on the shoulders of others who came before you kind of thing. But he did appreciate um, the courtesy of reaching out to him. With that, and also I would like to also mention a little tip of the cap to um, David Thompson, who recently did uh, Pavlov's House, because his use of 3D6 die rolls has also given me some interesting ideas uh, for different aspects of the game, uh, different ways to represent certain things uh, that are going on here. So, um, you know, playing his game last year made me think about that, and I found a probability page and all that kind of stuff. So that's also kind of worked its way into the design is the use of the 3D6 as well. So, so basically, I'm, I've spent the last almost 10 days working on nuts and bolts, thinking about ideas, jotting ideas down. And I finally, what you see in front of you here is extremely raw, about as raw as it can get. Um, if this was, um, if I was building a house, this would be like the the mud <laughs> dig, digging for the basement for the foundation, if you will, uh, is what you see here. So, um, so anyway, so I've started to to do this, and again, I'm just going to share some basic ideas. Eventually, my hope is once I get it refined a little bit and tweaked uh, to actually do like a little playthrough video, uh, and then if it seems like things are working, then also you know see if any folks are interested in in doing some play testing, and of course. As I'm making these videos, if there's any game companies out there uh, watching them and stuff, if this seems like it's something interesting that you might be interested in publishing, you know, um, feel free to reach out to me. So, um, basically, when I started working on this, I thought about all the books I've read. I also read a recent book called How Carriers Fought, which um, Dean Brown, who designed B-17 Flying Fortress Leader, uh, recommended to me, and that was a huge help. It was a, such a great, concise um, wealth of information in that book. And really, if you're the commander of the task force, if you're the admiral, carrier warfare in 1942, which is what this game focuses on. I'm not worried about the rest of the war, because again, four of the five carrier clashes. And again, it's hard to believe when you know so much emphasis put on on carrier warfare in the Pacific, but. There were only five carrier versus carrier clashes. Four of them occurred in 1942. When you look at it, it basically boils down to, in essence, if you're the commander, sending out your search planes, getting those reports back, trying to decide which ones you think are accurate, 
and trying to decide how much of a strike to launch. Either a full strike, a partial strike, you know, how much of a cap to put up, how many of your fighters to commit to that. And that's basically, you know, it. You know, and, and that's the essence of it. That is the essence of what these carrier clashes were like. It was basically find your enemy and then be the firstest with the mostest, so to speak. So that's kind of my goal with this, is to keep it very simple, very straightforward. Um, and of course, since it is designed to be a solitaire game, uh, you know, it's there, there are, of course, a certain amount of charts and die rolling and stuff you're going to have to do, because that's just kind of the nature of the beast when you design a, a, a solitaire game. That's just kind of the way it goes. So uh, my ultimate goal, if this works out okay, is to not only have a, a solo game that's kind of quote-unquote generic, but also to create um, uh, scenarios for the four carrier clashes, and then also make some tweaks and adjustments in the game to make it so you can either play the USN or the IJN. And with, you know, certain historical things, for example, um, personally myself, and of course, you know, this is always, uh, I always welcome discussion and debate, but personally myself, I feel like that one of the big advantages the U.S. had was the PBY. You know, that plane really did a lot of work, you know, scouting and finding things and stuff like that, and, you know, its range and its duration up in the air, you know, that was a big advantage, in my opinion, to the United States. So, you know, that kind of thing, if you're playing the Japanese player, you're going to have to deal with that. You know, the idea that, you know, you might be found first, if you will. So, so anyway, let's just kind of run over um, a few things here uh, with what I'm doing. So here's my homemade map that I did. And this is my, uh, I decided to do a midway one because there's not as much geography. Um, I'm doing this at 50 miles per hex. So... Um, as you can see, midway is confined to one hex because, you know, that makes sense. And then, of course, I decided to go with the mega hexes because, again, for simplicity and, and ease of play, I just thought that, you know, if you were positioned, like here's my carrier task force for just, you know, this very initial play, you know, basically that means that search planes can go out roughly two mega hexes away. So it's a lot easier to say, okay, you know, I'm going to search mega hex 13, mega hex 9, oh, here's some clouds here and stuff. It's much easier and faster to go with that rather than being like, okay, so I'm going to search out one, two, three, four, five. Um, and also since the searches were in arcs, you know, it makes sense that you would be covering most of this space. Okay. So then once I had that figured out, um, a couple other things I've done, I'm including weather because it is interesting how much weather played a role um, in the carrier warfare. For example, you know, the clouds at the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Japanese... Uh, late day strike on May 8th completely missed the U.S. carriers. They were in the right area, but they completely missed them because of the cloud cover. They flew right over them, literally, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so I knew weather had to be an important thing. Search phase, uh, I noticed something interesting, and this kind of goes with my sequence of play, is that with the searches, most searches were launched between 5 and 6 in the morning, and most of the sightings and stuff were recorded no later than 9, 9.30 in the morning. So basically I designed just a search phase. Early in the day, you're kind of organizing yourself, getting things ready, and you got your planes out and you're just waiting, waiting to see if any information comes back, okay? And again, this is all very rough and raw. So like these two 10-sided dice you see here are two of my sightings that I had. I created three different levels of sightings, uh, basically for the game uh, from A through C. And then of course there's also um, a no sighting option, which when a mega hex is searched, I have counters that I pull, and it, the sighting reports can range anything from, you know, hey, I see 10 ships, to, you know, hey, there's two carriers, five destroyers, and two cruisers, you know, out here and stuff. And I did that um, basically because it's interesting that just the wide range of reporting that went on. Uh, and with the searches and such, you know, even again at the Battle of the Coral Sea, you know, there was a search report that came in late in the battle that, you know, American plane radio back and said, you know, there's a large force of ships. It looks to be about eight of them and stuff. And actually, whenever they waited for more information, which is one of the decisions in the game you have, whether you want to wait on certain turns to see if you get more information, more detail uh, about uh, a particular sighting, it turned out it was a big coral reef. 
is what it was, you know, which again, it's, it's, you know, you, you kind of think to yourself, man, how can you mistake that? But, you know, when you watch some of the archival footage and stuff and you look how far away these guys were looking at things, it's just, you know, it is understandable. You know? And again, things were very much um, in their infancy and such. So that's why I designed the map the way that I did with these mega hexes, basically for ease of play. Okay. For um, the turn itself, I basically have a search phase. And right now I have um, most of the turn broken down into um, two hour blocks. So like an early morning phase, a late morning, early afternoon, uh, mid-afternoon, and then late afternoon, and then of course a night end of day phase. But I may end up trimming that down to two. I can't quite decide yet. Uh, we'll see. So that's still kind of um, in flux at this point in time. But basically you have the searches, and I set things up so I have my little search area here. And again, I'm using dice right now because again, I'm not trying to make too many counters because I haven't made any final decisions on things but you know basically a place to hold them and then you know put down you know what the force was originally and then like my four-sided die so like this force here the report is one aircraft carrier that's the four-sided die I'm using the six-sided white dice to represent CVLs and then this is a set of destroyers so this is basically one carrier two light carriers and seven destroyers that are supposedly um, there. Um, and that's what the strike actually found when I decided to launch it because I thought, you know what, let me go see what's there. And I also launched a strike over here, which this one turned out to be a surface force of all things, which, you know, again, um, there's lots of things that could happen within the realm of possibility. You know, and the Japanese were known to use bait forces. So it would not be uncommon to suddenly run into some kind of you know, force and be like, oh man, there's no carriers here. Well, it could have been a bait force. Okay. So, as the as the player, as the U.S. player right now, that's because that's the way I'm working on this, um, you basically can launch your strikes. Um, you can record hits on ships. And then one thing I think that's important um, that I really haven't seen done in another game is, and we'll see how this works. I'm not sure how it's going to work, but... I'm going to record the hit. So like here you can see this was a force with the 10-sided dice or battleships. So since my guys got here and whoops, there were supposed to be carriers, but there are no carriers. Um, we, of course, pummeled the battleship. So at the end of the day, when all said and done, um, that's whenever we'll get the final damage report, if you will. Um, so right now, my pilots are telling me, hey, we got seven hits on that battleship, but is that what we got? You know, did it really do as much damage? You know, uh, think about, you know, the Battle of Midway when the Japanese pilots, you know, attacked the Yorktown. And then they came back and they said it was smoking and everything else. And then the next group came out and they, they attacked the Yorktown again because everything had been repaired. And they thought they were attacking a different carrier. So I'm kind of trying to make that uncertainty um, with this. So that's why uh, I'm, I'm not going to do final damage until, you know, the end of the day. But I will have adjustments. Like, for example... If there's uh, a Japanese carrier or CVL that's hit with X amount of hits, that will influence the Japanese action, whether they can launch a strike at all or, you know, how much of a strike they can launch. So, so that's part of that. So that's kind of the targeting um, forces there. For the Japanese, right now I'm experimenting with using cards um, for the Japanese. And I'm building decks based on... Um, stances, if you will. So right now I have the Japanese can take one of three stances, be cautious, be determined, and be confident. And then the cards represent everything from no action taken by them in that particular phase of the turn up to a strike or snooping, you know, searching, and then of course also potentially moving too um, as well. So, um, so that's with the Japanese actions um, with that. So, and then another thing I'm doing here, and if, um, let me see if I can get this up here, for the carriers, I'm kind of making cards for them. Now, these are bigger cards. What I'm using is, because I've gotten out of this hobby, I'm using the, um, the backing boards for um, comics to design this. So, like, my carriers that just attacked that force that turned out to be one carrier and two CVLs and a handful of destroyers, you know, turned out to be the Soryu. And we've got three hits on it right now, supposedly. My pilots have come back and said, hey, guess what? We hit it three times. Looks pretty good. 
you know, da 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 and stuff. But then we'll have to find out, you know, how many of those hits are for real. How many of them ended up being near misses? How many of them were minor, minor damage? You know, was there any critical hits? All that will be coming at the end of the day. So, again, so you can't make that decision right away and be like, okay, yes, I know that we've already crippled that carrier. Well, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know. You know, it's interesting, the, the reports from the pilots and then what, you know, you find out later from intelligence and even from history turn out to be sometimes very different things. So, um, so that's how I'm setting that up for the uh, Japanese carriers. Uh, I'm not really making cards for the other units, um, just the carriers, really. And speaking of which, uh, I've made some over here for the U.S. as well. Because here I've got the Enterprise and the Yorktown and... Uh, the Hornet, of course, because, again, this is basically Battle of Midway. Um, and if you notice here, the counters are very simple. Uh, I'm not going to try and get real complicated with the counters, I decided. Uh, my combat system is going to be very simple. There won't be a whole lot of calculation that needs to be done. Um, there will be taken into account um, disruption, because one of the things I found doing my uh, research for the design was how much anti-aircraft fire in 1942... Um, now, this is not necessarily true for the rest of the war, uh, as it progressed, but in 1942, that you know, anti-aircraft fire did a lot of really disruption of bombing runs, as opposed to actually shooting down a ton of bombers. Um, think of, you know, the torpedo groups that attacked the Japanese carriers at Midway. Uh, those were almost all downed by CAP, by the Combat Air Patrol, by the Zeros. Um, so CAP is a very heavy element in this game. Uh, as opposed to anti-aircraft is less so. But again, if it disrupts the formation, it's a negative die roll modifier whenever they uh, launch their particular attack. So again, each of the counters represents a certain number of planes, working on averages of, you know, planes that were taken into battle and stuff. Um, and again, you know, with the cards here, I'm just keeping it really quite simple. You know, I've got strike boxes here, so if you launch a strike, from the horn and I've got the combat air patrol box up here and then I've got damage too. I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to do damage the same way for both the Japanese and the US or do two different systems. I'm still kind of working that part out um, with that. So that's kind of um, you know what what I'm kind of looking at. I guess this is Yorktown actually but that's what I'm kind of looking at um, with that as well. So, so that's kind of um, the upshot of it. Uh, I do have a number of charts and tables that I've been um, that I've been making and stuff. Um, you know, just to give you an idea, for example, you know, if, um, you know, when the strike actually shows up and finds, you know, uh, if it's a C counter, which is the lowest level, basically saying, hey, there's eight ships here. Um, you know, hey, what exactly is there? Well, you know, I made the little chart with the tens and ones thing, and then you actually find out what's there. And of course, as you can see here by this one result, it is possible that there's no force. You know, like that um, coral reef example I was telling you about a little bit ago. So, again, emphasis on, you know, basically simplicity, giving the feel of what it was like to be, you know, the task force, uh, and the admiral in charge of the task force, and... Um, um, I forget where I was going with that thought, but basically the emphasis on the on the feel and the playability here, but also focusing on really the critical parts of what carrier warfare was like in 1942, which quite frankly was finding the enemy first and hitting him as hard as you can. So, so again, this is all in the raw, very raw stages, but I thought I'd share with you what I've been up to um, here over these last few days. So, um, at some point, I'm sure I'll take a break from this, because once I kind of do this a little bit, I'll probably take a step back, you know, and then I'll share some more uh, with my design diary, if you will, uh, as I progress along. Uh, currently, somewhere in the great state of Indiana, the Hoosier State, there is a package with my, after much consideration, I decided to buy a copy of this, of uh, my, um, excuse me, my Eastern Front Solitaire copy that I acquired. Um, it is winging its way to me. So, you know, of course, those of you who are my old subscribers, and I guess for my new subscribers, you know, my two greatest hit interests in military history are the Eastern Front of World War II and the carrier warfare. And, well, and strategic, too. I'm also kind of curious, um, you know, how the Japanese could have 
had tried to win the war, which, quite frankly, the more I study things, and when I've been working on this design, the more I'm convinced that the way the Japanese approached things in 1942, trying to force the big carrier battles, they had no choice. They had to do that. Now, of course, splitting their forces with Coral Sea and, and Midway almost simultaneously, uh, or at least happening close enough that, you know, not all six carriers of the Kido Batai were available um, for each operation you know, uh, being split instead of a progressive kind of thing. I mean, that's the only chance they had really was to do that, grab some more real estate, and then basically try to, you know, what they were planning on doing, bleed the United States. You know, there was no other option. You know, unlike other wars that Japan had started before, where other powers stepped in, like, for example, the Russo-Japanese War, and the United States stepped in as, as mediator, you know, basically the Japanese, their foreign power here, some people have talked about it being Germany, which to a certain extent I think that's true, but really the true quote-unquote foreign power was American public opinion. You know, I mean, they were basically trying to force a body count that was high enough that, you know, it, it just wouldn't be tolerated. Um, and again, you have to kind of wonder what would have happened if it had been midway in reverse. What if the Japanese had sunk four American carriers and had free reign, you know, to grab midway and, you know, to grab especially, particularly um, the South Pacific area, you know, New Cal and, and, and Fiji and, um, you know, Santa Cruz Islands and all that kind of stuff. You know, how would that have played out? That's a good question because all those losses and stuff, you know, how would that have played in Peoria? So. So I also find that part of the of the war interesting um, as well, too, the strategic aspect, if you will. So, Okay, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. That's what's going on. And again, this is extremely raw. Um, but, you know, I'll continue to refine things and, of course, make better uh, materials and stuff as things progress. So, um, so next time, I don't know if I'll see you with this. Maybe I'll see you with East Front Solitaire or maybe another game that I decide to use as a kind of take a break, you know, step back, push this aside and, you know, play something else and come back with quote unquote fresh eyes uh, to take a look at things um, further down the road. So that's what's been going on here at Barry Bones Wargaming Headquarters. I'll give you just kind of like a little update. So, as always, thanks for watching. And this is Tim Korsman from Bear Bones Wargaming saying we'll see you next time with either some more about carrier warfare or possibly, um, well, maybe an Eastern Front game. I mean, you know, let's be honest. I mean, you know, I have Trial of Strength still sitting there waiting for me. And, you know, there's always lots of Eastern Front stuff to do. So, okay. So, sorry, it's kind of late at night here. I know I'm rambling a little bit, so apologize uh, for that. It's been a, a long day with my little men, so to speak. So, Thanks for watching. We'll see you next episode.